Okay, so how many of you watch reality TV shows? Okay, how many of you know somebody who watches reality TV shows? That's it. You may not want to admit it yourself. Millions of people, not only in this country, but around the world, are now watching reality TV shows. In fact, according to the New York Times, 15 of the 20 most watched shows last summer were all reality TV shows. Some of these shows are produced in more than 50 countries around the world. Now, as a psychologist, I found these, these shows a new playground for me to do research in. Uh, I think I'm really lucky, probably one of the best jobs I can imagine, a really cool job, is working with reality TV, uh, both as a psychology consultant and as a casting advisor. Now, um, in the old days, in the, in the old days, the 70s and the 60s, a lot of the psychological research was carried out in the field. And that was one way that psychologists were able to study some of the important issues of the time. Uh, perhaps one of the most famous of those studies back in uh, 1971 were the studies carried out by uh, Philip Zimbardo at Stanford University, the famous prison studies you may have heard about. So what they did, they wanted to study the effects of being in captivity for both prisoners and guards. So they were offering $15 a day to college students and other volunteers who were willing to spend a week or two uh, simulating what it's like to be in a prison. So what happened was people were randomly assigned into one group or another, prisoner or guard, and they lived out this life in the basement of one of the buildings at Stanford University. Well, what happened was uh, pretty shocking. Some of the guards took on some very sadistic behaviors, and there was psychological abuse of some of the prisoners. So the study had to be stopped after just only a few days uh, because of the dangers that might have went on. So we, don't, we can't do studies like that and other studies that were similar to that uh, much anymore today, largely because uh, university research ethics committees won't allow it. Now, there's, there's probably two major reasons why they won't allow these kinds of studies to go on uh, in the university setting. The first one is that they tend to depend on deception. In other words, we lead the subjects into believing one thing and something else actually happens. Well, as you may know, in reality TV, we love deception. In fact, one of the earlier shows on TV that, that came on was a show called Candid Camera, which was all about deceiving people, uh, in that case just for fun, and seeing their reaction to those kinds of circumstances. So uh, deception is a big part of, of what happens in reality TV. The second reason why uh, it's difficult to carry out those studies is for health and safety reasons. It's pretty expensive to put in all the controls that you need uh, especially in the university setting, for the protection of the subjects in these kinds of studies. But the world of TV is really different. We have, there's lots of money there, and um, we have medical and psychological uh, people ready. I've been called in uh, a number of times to a set to deal with situations that were going on. So we have the built-in uh, health and safety issues uh, being dealt with. So what's a reality TV show like, for those of you who don't watch it? Well, I'm not going to talk about any specific show that I work on. I'm not going to talk about any specific people from any of those shows. But I'm going to sort of give you a generic idea of what they're like and how we can learn from them in terms of the things that go on. So in a typical show, for example, uh, you get a group of people. And you tend to get a very diverse group of people. They could be young. They could be old. They could be somewhere in the middle. Uh, they can be from the big city. They can be from a small town. They could be from the farm. They can be new Canadians, they can be fourth generation Canadians, they can be aboriginal. They can be straight, they can be gay, they can be transgendered. They can be social butterflies, they can be very introverted. They can be very smart in terms of high IQ, or they can be at the bottom of their class. You get the picture, they're a, a, a varied group of people. And what tends to happen is that you put them all together and they can go off on an island or in a house or somewhere where there's, there's uh, uh, exclusion, they're excluded from the world. They don't know what's going on outside of the little bubble that they're living in. Now, there's a, lot, a number of things that are thrown at them uh, while they're in the situation. Uh, for example, there may be challenges every week uh, where they have to do physical or mental challenges. And on, in addition to that, they will vote to throw somebody out of the house or the island each week. So there's a lot of pressure to perform. But of course, in the end, 
there's always a winner. And the winner tends to get a healthy prize. Could be $100,000, $500,000, cars, whatever. So there's a lot of motivation uh, to do well in these things. And what we learn is the importance of interpersonal or social and emotional skills, maybe a little bit of luck as well, but uh, all of those things come together in terms of being successful in these kinds of shows. Now, uh, part of what I do is collect a lot of information from some of these people before they actually appear on the show. We may get life history data, we may get psychological testing, we may do interviews. Uh, basically, we get a lot of data. And the fun thing is getting to be able to follow through over the six, eight, ten, whatever number of weeks and seeing what actually happens, who does well, who doesn't do well, and, uh, and studying the effects of this uh, real interpersonal kind of, a, of experiment. So one of the things we do in terms of any kind of assessment or testing is we look at the emotional intelligence of candidates. What is emotional intelligence? Well, there's several different theories about what emotional intelligence is, but generally there's three things that they share in common. One is your ability to identify your emotions or the emotions of other people around you, to know what it is or how you're feeling. The second one is the ability to manage those emotions. And again, manage your own emotions or even manage the emotions of people around you. And thirdly, the ability to focus those emotions or use those emotions to help you do things. To so know when you want to get angry or when you want to be sad or when you want to use whichever emotion you're going to use to help you get what it is that you want. Now, as I mentioned, there's several different models uh, of emotional intelligence, but just to drill down a bit, the one that uh, I like to use in this situation is demonstrated on this wheel. So there's five major areas that we would look at, for example. Uh, one is uh, self-perception, your ability to, to know your own emotions, as I mentioned earlier. Another one is self-expression. How well do you express those emotions? Are you very expressive? Are you kind of introverted and you don't express them very well? The next is your interpersonal skills. How good are you at initiating relationships with people? How good are you at maintaining relationships with people? And thirdly, we look at decision-making. In other words, how do you use your emotions to make various life decisions? And finally, we look at stress management. How do you deal with things emotionally when you're under stress? You know, what are your coping skills like? These are all measurable kinds of uh, attributes that we look at. Now, I don't want to give too much away about uh, what you need to be successful in these shows, but one of the factors we've discovered that works both in the, uh, in the reality TV world and in the real world in terms of uh, people being successful is within the stress management uh, slice of the wheel that I showed you, that particularly the ability to be flexible. We're finding that people who are flexible, as I'll illustrate, uh, tend to be a bit more successful in many of these types of things. Let's take a hypothetical situation. Uh, as I mentioned, it's not a real person, but let's call him Jason. Now, Jason is, uh, is a student of reality TV shows. There's a lot of people, and maybe some of you are out there, who follow these shows really carefully. They know everything about them. They know every character who's appeared. And as, they, as you would know, there's a lot of strategy involved. So Jason's the kind of person who has studied the show intensely, knows all the players, and he's got a game plan. He's got a, a really strong strategy that he's going to follow. He's seen what uh, has caused other people to lose, seen how other people have won, and he's put on a persona, and with that persona, he follows that game plan all the way through. Now, uh, what happened uh, with Jason, or what could happen, is that by sticking to this game plan, uh, he's really focused on himself and how he's reacting to the others. And he stays with it, even though what's likely to happen, or what tends to happen, is that things are evolving and changing all around him. People are changing. People are forming alliances with others. Uh, they're making deals. They're winning competitions. And what happens... Uh, in this particular case, would be that uh, Jason would probably be left out of some of those things because he's so focused on his game plan. He's not flexible. And again, in order to be successful in, in many endeavors that we do, 
we find that flexibility usually goes a long way. The ability to uh, go with the flow, to be able to adapt yourself to both the environment around you and to the people around you, to be able to change quickly. Uh, we find that people who tend to be successful in life, as well as TV, who are able to get on top of situations and move with them are much more likely uh, to be successful in these kinds of situations. Another area that's kind of important is self-awareness. Now, self-awareness was part of that self-perception uh, slice that I talked about. But what's interesting about self-awareness uh, is that, you know, I mentioned we want to be in touch with our emotions. For example, uh, one benefit of, of that would be if, for example, I felt a, a little pit uh, in the bottom of my stomach, something was bothering me in, the, in my stomach right now, it would be very easy for me to jump to the conclusion that, oh, I must be really nervous. I'm standing here in front of 250 people and whatever number of people online. <sighs> it's nerves, right? My stomach is, is flooded with nerves. That would be a very quick conclusion, but if I zoned in on my, my, my feelings and what was really going on, my self-awareness, uh, I might actually conclude that, you know, I had a sore stomach yesterday from something that I ate, and maybe this is part of that sore stomach that I'm feeling today. And that would be a totally different direction uh, for me to go in, in terms of trying to, to deal with what's going on. That's what self-awareness, and it's really a good thing for us to be self-aware and to get to understand our emotions and where we're coming from. However, uh, sometimes... Self-awareness, we can have too much of a good thing. And back to Jason, what we found with him is he scored really high in self-awareness. But the problem was he was so focused on himself and his own way of dealing with others that he didn't pay attention to the world around him. He wasn't going with the flow. He wasn't observing uh, where he should be paying attention to uh, in the heat of the moment. So sometimes we get so focused on ourselves and our own feelings that we tend to ignore what's going on around it, us. And I see that as a balance. We have to balance uh, both our interpersonal life and our self-perception, our ability to be aware of what it is we're feeling and what's driving us, and our ability to interact with others, to observe them and understand what they're feeling and where they're coming from. That's a big part of what leads to success in life and reality TV. I like the example of an equalizer in music. You know, when you're with an orchestra or a band, you have to adjust the sound levels, the pitch and sound levels of the different instruments. So when the melody's going on, you want the higher pitched instruments to be louder with the melody and the, the bass and the lower pitched instruments to bring it down, to tone it down. So you can adjust it till you have the right uh, pitch that you want across the board. Well, our emotions are a lot like that as well. Sometimes we've got to be really assertive with someone, and other times we want to be laid back and just let things flow until we're ready. So we have to be able to manage our emotions almost like this equalizer where we're able to dial in and out the various components of emotional intelligence. And as you see here in this example, the um, emotional uh, self-awareness is dialed up and it may be, in this case, too high. Because what happens if we dial in too much self-awareness, we become narcissistic, <laughs> right? We focus out everybody else and focus in only on ourselves. Of course, if you want to be on reality TV, it helps to be narcissistic. Um, but that's what happens if we overfocus in those areas. So how does this re to relate to reality? Well, this is me when I went to university here a few years ago. Yes, I did. Now, when I came here to school, I had a game plan, too. I had a very strong game plan. Uh, you know, my mother thought it would be really important if I became a dentist. And I came here and, and took all the right courses, physiology, calculus, uh, organic chemistry, chemistry. Uh, like, these were like some of the hardest courses I could imagine. And I got to tell you, I struggled with those courses. I barely passed some of those courses. But the good thing was, for, uh, for lightening the load, I would take the first year one course and then more each year of something that I was kind of interested in. And of course, for me, it ended up being psychology. And the interesting thing about that is that taking psychology 
was so much easier for me than these other courses. I didn't even have to work as hard, and I got great marks in it. And, you know, so if I followed my game plan, I could have just plugged away at those sciences and worked more and more hours and studied more and more uh, and hopefully bring those marks up to get to where I wanted. But, you know, there was anxiety that, uh, that was kind of keeping me there and preventing me from switching direction because I knew if I went to be an independent health professional, it would be a sure job. I have no problem making a living after school. I finished. The other way, the psychology way at that time, was kind of a dangerous way to go because there was not much in the way of job prospects. It was a newer area to go into. So I had to abandon my game plan. I had to shift gears. You know, we, we, we sometimes are afraid to be flexible because there's a safety net in staying with the old and not with the new. But fortunately, things worked out well, right? I went through and moved all of my courses into psychology, did well, became a psychologist, and then sort of transitioned into an entrepreneur and, um, and now have an internationally known uh, psychological test publishing company. So it went well. And the good news is I wasn't alone in making this transition. Some other people who you all know who are quite famous in the technology uh, entrepreneurial industry all went through similar kinds of transition. Steve Jobs, as you know, dropped out of college in his first year uh, formally, but he hung around still to take some courses of interest. He took calligraphy, which helped him when they developed the Macintosh. Bill Gates dropped out of college uh, in his first year at Harvard because he wanted to pursue his love of building a software company. And Michael Dell, who was a pre-med student at the University of Texas, uh, had more fun building and selling computers on campus than he probably would have had being a doctor. So he dropped out and started Dell Computer, one of the world's biggest computer companies. Now, don't get me wrong. My message here isn't that you should drop out of college. <laughs> But it's really that, you know, sometimes we've got to look for a plan B. We've got to be able to make shifts in our lives and changes that we'll be happier with in the long run. So how do we take the reality out of reality TV? When we look at some of these attributes like flexibility and so on, we find that there's things you could do. You could become uh, more flexible in your life by doing things like uh, going to new places, meeting strangers, taking courses that you haven't taken before, you know, being really aware of yourself and your feelings, what you want to do, making a plan that goes out for the next one year, five years, ten years. And, you know, you don't have to jump out of airplanes. That's not what I'm saying by being flexibility. But taking more risks with the things you do because, um, you know, it could be a benefit in the long term. My message to you is don't be afraid of change. Embrace it. Thank you.